Hello! Welcome! Hi! We're the, so, <laughs> we're the Microbiology Journal Club on YouTube, and this is our news week, so we explore some of the news stories. I'm Fazal Am, this is my colleague Danny Chan. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, we talk every week, actually, about microbiology journals, uh, uh, well, journal articles, um, and this is the week where we sort of do an overview so that the next week, the following week, we can dive into figure by figure um, and figure out what's going on. There's so yeah. much literature out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we this one is going to be an overview where you take a look at some papers that we thought were interesting, and then, then at the end of it, we're going to have a battle to see which one are we going to deep dive, dive deeper into to figure out, well, go amongst the data. Mm -hmm. So, And so, uh, yeah. if you want to join us uh, with your suggestions or yeah, papers you think you want us to cover, please interact. Leave us a comment in the comments below or tweet us. Um, that's, that's the best way to get in touch. So let's yeah. dive in, I guess. Um, the first paper we have is this COVID-19 and film your hospital conspiracy theory, social network analysis of Twitter data. Yes, um, from the Journal of Internet Me Medical Research, uh, I believe. <laughs> Medical and Internet Research, which is just uh, already, I'm only, I'm getting vibes from that. Oh no! But actually, going this paper, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's lots of research like this. It's not something we would typically cover. Like both mm. of our backgrounds are infectious disease, sort of like animal models, mm. um, is what we did during grad school. But uh, you know, I mean, science is science, and in this one, they're trying to understand like sort of the main players in these conspiracy theories, right? Like trying to find the the accounts that are at the middle of it all, <laughs> um, and also just. I think it's um it's sort of a surveillance as well, like sort of uh, checking the health of health of discourse and like what sort of theories and how they propagate. You know, it's like very yeah. modern, I guess, like <laughs> research that's being done with Twitter data streams. Yeah, I mean, th this journal has tweetations as well as c instead of citations, which is <laughs> I, which I just love. I think that's very futuristic, and it's. But I think it's a, it, this does explore an important thing of the there's an infodemic. I mean, this is. And in, in, in an issue that is specifically designed to collect papers that are looking at the coronavirus like infodemic and like what are the for sure for sure what are the main sources of misinformation? I mean, YouTube yeah. is one of them, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the hope is that like when these studies come out, that it sort of informs maybe like better moderation like practices, right? Maybe it even yeah. like can talk to direct actions that platforms can take to try to make sure that the there's like healthy information flow and there people don't get like siloed i guess into certain conspiracy theory sources of information <clears throat> yeah and uh, yeah they do all sorts of cool things like try and measure how much bots uh, have an effect on this specific specific uh, aspect of misinformation and and that's it, i think that's qu quite interesting uh yeah but, but probably not in our, our wheelhouses, but I think yeah, it's worth yeah, a look. Yeah, probably not <laughs> Interesting to show that it's around, right? And I mean, everyone, hopefully uh, viewers will know, right? Like, like the world is big. There's lots of science mm. on everything. And this is just like one of the examples of science on the Twitterverse. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it gives you a good idea of like what kind of, uh, kind of people tend to be... Because, I mean, it does, like, go a almost a little bit too far that it might provide some identifying information for people, which I'm not sure I'm okay with. But on the other hand, it does give you a, a lens to look at how these networks work. They have some lovely diagrams of, like, how these different networks connect to each other. Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, let's see. What else do we have? So this, then, this is loosely related to our theme of the, the current epidemic. <laughs> yeah, so this one is lockdown-related travel behavior undermines the containment of SARS-CoV-2. So if we're in the UK like me, you might know that on Thursday we're going to be going into lockdown uh, again. Mm. So it's... so <laughs> Round you know, two. Yeah, for our Halloween celebration, we watched Boris Johnson present graphs, which is probably the most frightening thing ever. So, <laughs> I mean, this is uh, an in interesting paper because what they did is they took Facebook data from... Some people have the Facebook app, and Facebook has this thing called, like, I think, Data for Good, where they they, they pull, like, anonymized data. And for this COVID outbreak, they've been trying to monitor, like, where where people have been clustering and travel behavior. And this has been looking mm. at travel behavior in, in I, I think it's in the in New York and in uh, India and then a couple of other places where they <laughs> announced lockdowns, and they looked at the travel behavior just before the lockdown came in. So, and, mm. and they've... 
And based on their findings, they found that the travel pay, once the lockdown was announced, travel kind of changed a bit. Lots of people moved out into the country or moved away from cities. Sure. Uh, which the researchers uh, posit is probably could probably increases the risk of of like the outbreak spreading, just creating secondary outbreaks because they're for mm -hmm. and that like the longer the lead time between announcing the lockdown and it coming to play, the more that has an effect. But mm -hmm. that's basically as far as like, they do some simulations to say like, oh, okay, well we if if uh, by a model this might suggest that coronavirus would spread more, but they don't actually have the hard data on the end, they just have the movement data, and then they've got some really clever algorithms that are like, okay, this is how we expect the coronavirus would, would happen, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I've heard this, I've heard this anecdotally as well, right? Like news, news coverage in, in the States at least have talked about, right? Like when the big city shut down, people moved out to like rural areas and there was sort of a call for like, that's not necessarily the best thing to do because like it's not like you can just leave the city and everything is different right like it's <laughs> the world is all connected and so yeah there was definitely yeah. um so in some ways it's like don't be maybe we don't know how how this uh this pattern that they observe like actually will apply in your specific scenario but maybe a good warning to not be part of that problem <laughs> if you can right if it's yeah. possible in your so situation I so they, they emphasize four points like the and one important thing is to the messaging of how to prepare for lockdown so they make make sure that when people are going to lockdown they know exactly where the local supply chain is coming from to, to, to decrease mm, the amount yeah. of panic buying and hoarding because mm -hmm. otherwise people will end up with, with throws of toilet paper that they won't know what to do with and they'll try to return <laughs> up or and also decreasing the window of time between announcement and the implementation of lockdown policies which is sure. also quite important and also like um Communicating, communicating the risks of actually people traveling and migrating away from cities to, to mm -hmm. cause secondary outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and fourth is most important, providing the resources needed for people to stay, which is the probably the most hardest of all of them, because yeah. it requires a lot of. So, <laughs> so I so I thought this paper is like it's well worth yeah. a read, but probably it's not something. Yeah. Very big data style, actually. Big data in a yeah. way that we don't see it in biology. This is like, I don't know, I guess it's a bit questionable, the data source, but like, right? Like, just from the ethical standpoint, right? Like, yeah. large data sets collected on people's movements. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> on, on the other hand, like, lots of countries have track and trace apps, which do the exact same thing. But they, can, mm -hmm. they can't do that from this kind of research with that, because this one compares different countries, whereas the NHS track and trace app that I currently have only does the UK. So, Facebook... Sure. They have, people have Facebook apps on all their phones. Some people in the audience probably have a Facebook app on their phone that's watching them <laughs> right now. But it's... <laughs> but yeah, but, yeah. The, but so... Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the, you know, it's one of the benefits of having like a large multinational corporation holding all this rather yeah. sensitive data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's always there's good sides and bad sides to being surveilled constantly throughout your entire life <laughs> and not having any freedom. But, you know, make lemonade. Um <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Okay, let's see. Um, trans next one. Trans ethnic analysis reveals genetic and non-genetic associations with COVID-19 susceptibility and severity. Yeah, this is from 23andMe. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm not, this is like another <laughs> large data set from a private company, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> once again, um, for better or for worse, we've trusted uh, companies with <laughs> this data and uh, they're, they're doing research, right? They're trying to figure out stuff that might be useful for yeah. us and publishing that and the stuff that's useful for them, well, they just keep that. Uh, <laughs> and, and, this, and this one they're looking for, it's almost like a, a GWAS, right? Yeah. I mean, just against like the SNPs that they collect, um, trying to figure out things that might associate with uh, risk of COVID-19. Um, I don't know. I don't find this stuff incredibly useful. I just think it's like, it's fun to always point out, right? Like, yeah. this exists. This is what people do with big data, right? Like, um, yeah. is find these associations. And I don't know, the, what, what, what will we do with this data when we find it? You know, like, I guess that's always the big question. Like, it could inform therapeutics. Um, I would hope that it, like, there's always the danger that it informs kind of like misguided thoughts about like, specific populations yeah. that are like dangerous right i think that like that's important always to think about when when these papers come out and like more than ever because 23 me is such a huge company like uh like these these results like make it out you know they're the exciting ones <laughs> scientists are always doing gwas but when 23 and me does a stiff analysis um i don't know it gets more like yeah 
and uh, and basically yeah, between, between three me is uh, most of it is ancestry based stuff which means that they are often dealing with ethnicity and those that sort of data so that's almost yeah. You have to be careful about that. So how is that useful, right? Like, how yeah. might that be useful when we're thinking about disease, the SNPs that they find? Of course, I didn't, we didn't, I haven't read this paper deeply, so I'm not really sure what SNPs they found and whether or not those might deal. I think I saw something about blood type, maybe. I think we've heard that before as well yeah. during this outbreak, that blood type might correlate in some way, but it's, like, unclear, right? Like, we have no idea um, from a mechanistic point, how, like, how do you connect the associations found in these large things to then biological data that we know that's happening in cells? That's like the big challenge. Yeah. The, the, these are purely, there's always something else that could interfere. And they do try to like keep, categorize quite a lot of different things like obesity mm -hmm. and like socioeconomic status. But even mm -hmm. so, this is very like tough to interpret and might not be very useful for, for us basically mm -hmm. because so much can be explained by socioeconomic and other factors. So Absolutely, it's... yeah. I think that that's a big thing, like doing a study like this. Yeah, like a big uh, blind spot, basically, right? That is very hard to incorporate into the models and remove the influence of. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so it's... But the interesting thing is the the 23andMe involvement with that, the fact that these genetics... Because usually you see these come out of com like com uh, hospitals or... So like university, mm -hmm. but this is like, like your homegrown like. I mean, it's kind of interesting how how uh, widespread genetic testing has become. That <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> it's no longer something that you necessarily like go to the hospital for or ask your doctor for. Like these are consumer products that are around, and you know, I guess with all consumer products, buyer beware, right? Like you gotta you gotta make sure you know what you're getting and and what you're getting is worth what you paid for it. Um, I know that with 23andMe, a common thing that I always say is that they have that like checkmark box where it's like, where you say like, I want to help scientific research and thus give my data, right, to be mm. analyzed. Like, for, presumably that's who makes up these data sets, right? Yeah. Um, and like, you got to be careful because like, when you check that box, you're not only giving your data away for studies like this, which like might have some use, but maybe not, but you're also giving away for other studies that like, um, maybe you're looking for different drugs and like, who knows, right? Like what it could be used for. Um, yeah. It's not just published, public, publicly available things. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, let's see the next, oh, the, the next one is an interesting one. Uh, this one is uh, mm. molecular, Mole I could... sorry, you go ahead. Uh, <laughs> after you, I insist. Um... <laughs> Molecular architecture of early dissemination um, and a massive second wave of SARS-CoV-2 virus in a major metropolitan area. This is Texas. Mm. <laughs> it's coming out of Houston is the major metropolitan area um, of their choice. And uh, I heard about this paper because it's going to get published soon, I think, in mBio. This is the preprint version of it that we have. Um, and they have like a big hospital center in Houston. Uh, oh. and that makes it really good for collecting tons of data. Yeah, I mean, these, there's some really big names on here. So I, I do reckon, because like working at Strep, the, there's some people who are big names in the grand positive like community here, like Randall Olson and yes. James Musser, who are like yes. really big big names in Texas. And so yes. this is... Uh, yeah, yeah, th these are great scientists that have put, that have basically, um, because of their like large hospital cluster, they've been able to collect like huge amounts of data with yeah. the, second wave that happened uh and they start drawing like i mean they really map it out quite detailed because i think they sequence the virus yeah in they've got all these circumstances yeah they've got actually like an amazing sequencing lab there so they can do quite a lot of like sequencing stuff so and they've yeah. done that they've so we're uh, seeing like in this outbreak in in houston where all these people get infected what are the sequences of viruses that are coming out and how are they changing right um yeah through, through that time uh yeah, there's lots of information here. I think it's interesting. I mean, again, it's speaking a lot to these mutations of the spike protein, I think, is what they're choosing to highlight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and one and... thing they, they highlight is the uh, there's new mutant G614 uh, mutant. So in the original recipe SARS-CoV-2, it was a D in, in a certain area, but then it turned into a G. And mm -hmm. this new... And it's that this is like the big new hotness now, trying to figure out what's... What's the deal with it? What's the significance? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> it's clear from uh, it's clear from efforts like these that this variant is widespread. <laughs> yeah, um, 
and the big question is why? <laughs> um, yeah, because so. I think we're still in that mode where we're calling them some, you know, this is a a, ver a sequence variant, but does it have biological significance? That's the big question everyone's trying to ask. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess that's a good segue into the next cluster of papers we yeah. have. <laughs> yeah, uh, so because we're going to talk a bit more about the D614G. Uh, I, I just want to show that like there's this like am amazing graph which basically like shows how the massive difference in finding the, the the frequency of it because we've got D614 which is this tiny blue like peak and then this massive G614. So mm -hmm. yeah, but we, yeah, we are definitely going to be talking a bit more about this. So the next paper is the uh, infectivity of so this one is about the D614 like isolate, but it goes a little bit. It looks at the other genes to see whether there are other variations that could be having an impact on it. Mm -hmm. So this is a so infectivity of SARS-CoV-2 bracket. I'm sorry, not brackets. Uh, colon. There is some. There is something more than D614G. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is yeah, a lesser, because maybe so things yeah. that might be correlated with the change, right? Like yeah, <laughs> uh, all that focus seeing that this isolate is the one, but like what about other genes that correlate? Because it, it might not be an effect purely from the one change, right? There could be things that come with it um, that are yeah. And they have like maybe some other you know, biological function. Yeah. Um, and what are they? It's a one panel. It's sort of a one figure paper. So yeah. Nice and concise. So it's it's a, a letter, so it's a, basically they're very concise. They, they there's one mm -hmm. figure that kind of shows that that there are other mutations other than the one in the S protein. So things in S and NSP12 and in NSP14. Uh, so other other areas that could potentially be worthy, worthy of investigation. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is just uh, almost broadening that that story, seeing like there could be other stuff. But absolutely, it's... yeah. I mean, it's good, right? Because I think that especially when we think about news media, it's easy to like get pegged down a thing, or it's like science found something. That's the thing. Yeah. But, you know, like <laughs> uh, you know, there's always biology is a very like messy area, right? And like yeah. there could be things that happen, sort of like. Um, they're, I mean, they're basically covariants, right? Covariant gene changes that yeah. are occurring that could also explain this 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 phenomenon that we're seeing with the spike protein mutant. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah ex exactly. Um, and then the next one is uh, again s spike mutation D six one four G also SARS CoV two fitness. So this is mm -hmm. more so looking at fitness. This looks at uh, uh, infections in like hamsters and lung epithelial cells and it's looking at how it uh, enhances the re replication of the virus so it does mm. seem that it, so it seems like in certain models it is definitely doing something and that like that's that like ham hamsters like infected with the original uh, recipe uh, have a slightly higher neutralization than compared to the uh, actually hold on, wait. They, they but they seem to still be having the ability to protect. So there's that paper last time when we talked about the vac. So the vaccines still protect mm -hmm. both of them like the same. But yet there's this idea of like oh. the. I can't open this paper from the Zotero, so I'm not looking at it right now. But okay. I'm looking at the abstract. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but ba basically, I think that like the mutation doesn't reduce the ability to, of vaccines to to protect against COVID-19, but it's still in, impacting infectivity. So we did have that, like, I think a couple of weeks ago, we had like a model of it and showing the demutation is yes, really where it is. He mm -hmm. hepped up inside the spike protein. So it wouldn't be visible to, to antibodies anyway, but it must be doing something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, these papers are, so the next paper also is very similar. So it's uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike D614G confers enhanced replication and transmissibility. So mm -hmm. again, this is also t taking a look at, at that and trying to answer the question of well, if it's if it's not protective of the immune system, then what is it doing? Uh, so I mean, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're basically saying. Well, that... I mean, they are they are trying to narrow down the reasons, like, and it could be it could be something like better binding right yep. to the receptor. Uh, it could be, I mean, it could be faster fusion, right? Better binding is made up of a lot of different things, right? It could yeah. be better fusion capabilities. Maybe they don't like prematurely fire. That could be like something that's going on. Um, yeah. What do they track it down to in this paper? Or do they end up tracking it down? I'm seeing- They don't really, tr they, they basically go into like, 
saying like increases in binding and and replication uh and they, mm-hmm. and they do like do competitive like studies where i think they basically yeah look they at... do it seems like they're they start from the biochemistry of binding and they say that better binding then translates into the animal models yeah yeah. So that's a that's a clear story, but it could easily oh, be. they're using com- they are using the transmissibility um, model for hamsters, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess this is not the golden. This is not the golden hamster, is it? This is just some other hamster. Uh, the Syrian. Think, yeah, Syrian hamsters. Um, <laughs> I, I guess we'll go we'll go sense. into that a little bit later today because we are going to be talking about the applicability of mo- models in host ranges. Sure. And, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, and they also use ferrets <laughs> i'm just yep. looking at the figures i'm like trying to identify the animal from their outline <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's look, cool i mean it's nice yeah. to see that um you know like we talked about these models earlier and mm. like they're coming right now this is the time to use models now right like we have a variety of models to choose from so scientists can ask more complicated questions right about like how does this change actually affect some disease process and then you have to choose the model that fits that disease process that you want to ask the question about yeah uh yeah f- for sure um cool yeah cool uh that's what we got else what else have we got uh, oh we that's got... oh we got oh. two papers on well we got two papers but i want to do this sometimes because i did this a couple times with immunology papers where where i've got two papers i'm gonna put up side by side one is saying like, longitudinal observation and decline of neutralizing antibody responses in three months following SARS-CoV-2 infection in humans and next one yes. is uh, robust neutralizing antibodies to, to SARS-CoV-2 infection persist for months. So these two papers were published yes. about the same time. They both seem to be saying the opposite things. Basically, mm-hmm. one of them is saying like, oh, you still get robust neutralizing antibodies for a long time after infection. And the other one is saying they decline. And the thing is, looking at the data, they're both actually saying the same thing, but in different ways. So yeah. the thing is, like, the antibody responses do decline in the, this first paper, but they don't disappear. And the interesting thing about this first paper is that they take a, a small number of people and they really focus down on what those antibodies are, uh, are attacking. So they look at different SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So not just spike, but also like a couple of the end proteins and see like how the degree to which that antibody response declines. And yeah, it mm-hmm. does de- decline, but that's somewhat expected uh because yeah i mean yeah. like we don't we don't like upon being infected it's not like you like just spike in protein and you maintain high protein levels it's yeah. a lot for your body to make those things yeah so <laughs> they they, it, they so this one is good at actually characterizing the different aspects of and also like it gates by how how uh the, whether it's moderate or a severe infection and mm. seeing that people with severe infection tended to car- carry that neutralizing antibody response for longer um mm-hmm. and that's... i mean this i was gonna say these are these stories are from a long line of like we've been hearing about how long does the antibody response yeah. last for right like for some time and like i think that's why we dipped in briefly into like all that cellular immunity stuff yeah. because like it was seeming like oh maybe antibody isn't what describes it um but i guess with all this more data like there's still more to say, right? Because it's sort of uh, not quite, people haven't settled on their the best explanation for these things. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I, I definitely can see that. And I, I, I definitely feel like the for this paper, the decline of neutralizing antibody responses isn't necessarily the big like takeaway from it. That is, mo- it's mostly like looking at those individual proteins that I found most interesting. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think to me, it's like the headline tells you one thing. Yeah. <laughs> but when you go into the figures, you're like, oh, but like really what they're providing, what we're learning is not like from the title. What yeah. we're learning is from like the specific data that they collected. And that's like, oh, wow, we've never seen such a comprehensive right look at all these different proteins and their antibody responses. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas the second mm-hmm. paper, t- so the first paper did about like, I think, in the region of like 50-ish people, the second paper did about 50,000 or something. It did quite... <laughs> it, it, yeah. No, 30,000 people were, were screened and then they were tested and then they were measured for several months afterwards and still found to have antibodies. Um, mm-hmm. So the antibodies are still there, but yeah, if you look at their figures, there is still that decline there. So there are less. Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's always a huge decline yeah. at the beginning. That's just how antibodies go, right? And if yeah. you get... Presumably when you get reinfected, you have memory and like then you get another spike in antibodies. Um, 
so it's not bad that antibodies go down, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's sort of what what yeah to be expected. Um, yeah. But of course, the speed at which they go down could speak to whether or not like you would get like a um, whether you could be reinfected in a certain window, right? Like there's all yeah. these. It could say something about the characteristics of the disease, but like they haven't correlated it to that. Yeah, I mean they they got like a a, a graph that that basically like shows the the antibody like responses and they just tend to go up and down it seems almost like completely noise uh so mm -hmm. there's rough with like blue line on top of uh of like the percentage of titles that have that and it's just like <laughs> yeah and, yeah you can sort of see like how how it's possible you can pick depending what what time scale you, you can get almost any result because there is so much right. noise there um are you you're talking about figure 1b <laughs> uh looking at figure 1a but uh oh, 1, 1a Okay. One B could. I mean, one B is. I was just uh, wondering about uh, where, where's the blue line that you're speaking about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is in uh, robust. Uh, so, uh, ro sorry. Uh, robust, robust neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, mm -hmm. Figure one B. A. One uh, uh, A. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that. So it's it's interesting and it's complicated because again with with big. With big uh, kind of samples like this, a lot of the kind of individual stories will be kind of averaged out. So, mm -hmm. the, absolutely. So there is going to be a lot of fluctuation there because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, I just want to bring these two papers up just because it's, I found it funny that like I saw the two of these on my feed and they're both saying the opposite things. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think that like uh, again, it's the I I feel like there's not a lot of uh consensus in like the messaging about like what antibodies are good for yeah <laughs> and like what's normal and what's like abnormal from the SARS-CoV-2 because like a lot of this is characterization it's like stuff that you would do for any disease yeah and like these are patterns you might see in any disease um yeah it's not necessarily unique for SARS-CoV-2 but again good we, we want to collect it for SARS-CoV-2 because we want to understand what is happening right now yeah <laughs> to exactly these population, to our population going through this particular event and I think for this paper is specific especially like this they, this is a massive amount of people that you wouldn't necessarily get for other infectious diseases because some of them oh yeah yeah That's so true. you we're actually getting quite a lot of a, a massive cohort of seeing like how the immune system works through a specific stimulus so that's an opportunity mm -hmm. for learning, which is mm -hmm. always what we're about. Um. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Let's see what else we got. Oh, okay. We have one thing that we're categorizing as vaccine news. Yep. Um, it's it's <laughs> actually not a paper about SARS-CoV-2 at all. <laughs> no, it, it is I, not. Uh, but it, it's about a story. I found it like linked to this Quanta article, and they had linked it to SARS-CoV-2 being like, oh, look, there's like some new immunology coming out saying that the BCG vaccination in humans elicits trained immunity by the hematopoietic progenitor compartments. Yeah. Um, and this is like real basic immunology, I guess. That's <laughs> that's that this is about. And I don't know if anyone recalls, but like there is some talk that the BCG vaccine, which is for tuberculosis, might have some cross protection um, for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. And that's super perplexing because normally we think of <laughs> vaccines as being antigen specific. Mm -hmm. So like they should just induce immunity towards the specific thing that you're trying to induce the immunity towards. Um, but actually, you know, it's, I was, there's like a This Week in Virology podcast and turns out there's anecdotal evidence like going all the way back to the beginning of this vaccine that it does have some cross protection. And this paper is trying to illuminate a little bit of that potential mechanism. Yeah. Um, so this is, I mean, this is actually being trialed against COVID. So in Australia, there's yes. a university that's running phase three trials on BCG as a protective thing for COVID. But yeah, obviously this would be great if that ends up having a good effect because like, yeah, we already cause... make BCG. Yeah, <laughs> we already know the safety profile of BCG. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I've already had the BCG, so I'm protected. <laughs> um... <laughs> I think most, it's, uh, I know just uh, the United States and Canada, they don't give BCG um because they want like surveillance i think if you get bcg vaccine you have a positive skin test yeah so you can't you can't have that simple test for um for tb yeah i mean why protect people against tb when you can let people get sick and so you can figure out whether tb's out there <laughs> i mean her that's herd immunity in practice is we don't have to treat the disease otherwise we won't know how it spreads 
<clears throat> so obviously um, I'm cynical because I'm from the privileged PCG and vaccinated cohort. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was a, from my understanding, it was a sound like public health decision to make because BCG vaccine is not one, like not super effective. The efficacy yeah. is like in the middle, yeah. which I mean, this is like a really interesting topic. Like when we talk about vaccines, we may get from the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, right? Yeah. Like, I think, of course, if they're not very effective, we don't really need to not give it for surveillance purposes. <laughs> but like, I mean, it's possible to have vaccines that don't work all the time. And so when you get them, uh, you know, you still probably have to follow <laughs> a lot of the guidelines that we're following right now. It may not really spend, spell the end of the current situation that we're in, um, but it would certainly reduce the risk of people actually ending up in the hospital, which is, I mean, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> bring us the vaccine, please. And yeah, I'm quite interested in this trained immunity side of things because then it goes the other way. So if you've got like a vaccine that has a really good adjuvant, then that might seem mm -hmm. that it's producing like positive results, even if the vaccine itself isn't producing the kind of immunity we want, but it's still sure, helping people somehow. So. Yeah, I mean, I think this definitely, this is like a real basic immunology paper that kind of yeah. uh, tells us a little bit of a different story that these hematopoietic progenitor cells, I think they're often thought of as like part of the innate immune system, yeah. that they can somehow have some memory in them, right? And they go into some epigenetics and stuff uh, in this paper. So I mean, that's an interesting story, and a little bit far off from SARS-CoV-2, but I think that makes it, in, it's more like into the immunology aspects of things. Yeah, which, it's very much hard immunology. Yeah. It has this kind of like little, you know, the only reason I brought it up because I think it is relevant still in the news, mm -hmm. just to follow up on like, what is about this BCG vaccine, right? That like causes it to have cross protection. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we got a whole bunch about our favorite virus, learning more about it. Yeah. I love this like double header that came in science about neuropillin one. Yeah. Uh, one saying it facilitates cell entry and infectivity as the title, and the other a host factor for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yes. Um, and this is cool because we've been talking about ACE2, right? Mm. And like that's the receptor, that's where spike binds. Uh, but here are reports saying that there is another cellular receptor. Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I, that's a really interesting thing because... Uh, I mean, it has a lot of implications. <laughs> I mean, if this, if, yeah. if it's like, it's like, let's say, uh, so I, I don't know yet. Like, you know, we don't have the mouse model <laughs> that was given neuropillin <laughs> one, right. And then made to become like a good infection model. That would be kind of interesting to see if that's possible. Um, well, I mean, I want to go back to the hamster paper we saw where they SARS-CoV-2 was infecting ne ne neural cells. And check mm -hmm. whether hamster has like a, a human like neuro neuropillin because then that could help to boost that explain, result. Explain, yeah, explain the reason for this. But yeah, um, the neuropillin one on neural cells. So that this kind of it can help explain why people lose their sm sense of smell when they get SARS CoV 2. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, but again, I think when thinking about like what the virus is like, does it also mean that there's a reservoir of this virus, right? Like that could exist. Um, uh, when we're doing our receptor binding assays, right, should we also be looking at this uh, molecule, right, as a good, yeah. like, another comparison of the efficacy of a vaccine? Yeah, um, and even, saw, oh. even for drugs as well. So there's, like, some drugs that are interfering with ACE2. Maybe the people look at neuropillin 1 or... Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah, it's trying to figure out the interplay of it in, during infection, whether how important it is, because it could be that SARS-CoV-2 does bind it, but it might not be... It might be related yeah. to, like... Yeah, exactly. It might not actually have any real effect on the the outcome of the disease. But that's why I'm wondering, like, uh, it could if you made an infection model where they still had like bad ACE2, but the, the more realistic neuropillin one, does it does it create some sort of disease? Right. Can you create a disease in that in that circumstance? Yeah. Um, or maybe in people like maybe it's like, no, that's hard to see because all people have this. I was wondering if like you maybe you could look at variants of neuropillin one in people and try to figure out if it's important. I um, mean, the thing I think would be quite important is in disease etiology. So seeing other COVID, explaining other COVID symptoms like neurological symptoms, perhaps, or sure. like mm -hmm. things like COVID toes, what's causing that and mm -hmm. figuring out like, because we most with ACE2 are mostly looking at in the lungs, but there are all these other strange symptoms like and long COVID that, right. that right. we don't understand yet. And we found some, this new thing could be, could mean anything, but 
I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the day, all they're doing here is like associating this receptor with the ability to get into cell, cell culture, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but this is like one of those like great discoveries that two labs found at the same time. I imagine they both had to like agree, okay, we're all just published at the same time, so no one can claim to be the first. And yes, yes. I feel like nature does this a lot, though, right? I think they, oh. when they see it, they, they, they specifically create these like double header things, either contrasting or complementary. Yeah, I think that that's, this is basically what nature is for, because nature wants to find the first of everything. They want to be the ones who mm -hmm. claim to be first on everything, and so this is why you read nature, so you can read something that no one's uh, no one's ever found before. So, admittedly, it does have its downsides occasionally, because you do get stuff that isn't necessarily real, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for the most part, I mean, you don't read nature for like for your thesis. You read it for for interest, for like for finding out new yeah. things that could affect what you work, just coming out of left yeah. field. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, okay, so that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, and then we got, and they're, they're pretty small papers, so if we end up doing them, we can do them as a double, like, probably. Yeah. Uh, and then we have highly pathogenic coronavirus end protein aggravates lung injury by masp 2 mediated complement overactivation. This is a preprint uh, uh, that I found, and I was actually reading about they were talking about clinical trials in France that are going on mm. uh, to use like complement inhibition as a therapeutic for SARS-CoV-2. Mm. Um, and it's it's sort of based on this type of information that says that there's another like way that SARS can cause inflammation and it's by hitting the complement system, which we haven't talked about <laughs> yet. Yeah. You know, there's so many parts of the immune system that we don't get to review. Um, this is the one that's like yeah. in your, it's sort of like proteins floating in your blood. And like, if they find something not so good, they cause cascades of proteins to start clumping on the bad stuff. Um, yeah. The... And, and going down in uh, inflama inflammatory pathways. Yeah, that's a really cool uh, thing to look at. And I think it's basically summed up like why this is a cool paper, because we haven't had a chance to talk about complement. And... Also, we mm -hmm. have been like on a kick of looking at what other, the, the other coronavirus proteins look do, mm -hmm. and this yes. again is... here's another another coronavirus protein. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but um... I think uh, I feel like I have this understanding of uh, SARS-CoV. Af maybe after the last few weeks, like I'm definitely looking at this virus now and being like, there's so much that goes into making it such a strong inflammatory virus, right? Like. <laughs> Like there are all these aspects of it that are just like tickling our immune system and causing it to go haywire, right? And maybe yeah. not in a productive way, which sort of means some people won't get out of it good. <laughs> um, which yeah, we're seeing that in we see that in the the types of symptoms that people get and the the deaths that we see. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so next paper is SARS-CoV-2 desensitizes host cells. To interfere on through the inhibition of the Jack Stat pathway. Now, I, I mostly like <clears throat> pick, pick this one because it was a kin almost continuation. Because we in the last like uh, paper we did see like that some some proteins do bind to things in the Jack Stat pathway, mm -hmm. and that could affect the um, inflammatory. Oh uh, yeah, cycle. that's right. In that in that like uh, large panel they did, right? There were things. Yeah. There yeah there are mRNAs that got disrupted in the JAK-STAT pathway. <laughs> so yeah, that made me want to look into this a, a little bit more. Sure. <laughs> and and so this one came came across my desk and I was like, okay, this is interesting. The I mean the only problem with JAK-STAT pathway is probably one of the most important pathways in all of biology because it affects so many different things, but it's so complicated. Yes. And and it. it and it's because it does so many different things. It, the way the molecules interact is is so difficult to get your head around sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, like, there's there's many like the we we know the pathway is like a sequence of different proteins that get activated, but depending on when and like at what amount they get activated, they read out differently, right? It, they tell cells yeah. different things. Um, so yeah, it gets very much into the network aspects of like protein chains and trying to figure out how things are going. So this could potentially be a very math mathy paper or it mm -hmm. could... But it's again, interesting that they yeah. get at their story. The first figures are about ACE2, <laughs> right? And so they get to the Jack stat pathway through the receptor. Yeah, through receptor binding. It's interesting. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so there's there's that. Um, uh, uh, let's see. What else oh, do we have? Non-structural protein 1 of SARS-CoV-2 is a potent pathogenicity factor for redirecting host protein synthesis material, machinery towards viral RNA. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, like, basically the same... Uh, theory that was involved that that implicated the uh, the splicing of the stuff, right? It's like yeah, um, this idea of like hijacking that protein synthesis machinery to make more viral proteins, but now we have NSP one. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we did talk a little bit about NSP one binding the RN the ribosomes, uh, so mm -hmm. blocking mRNA entry into the 4DS ribosome, which is what they said in the previous paper. What these guys do is they use uh, cryo EM. So they've got so you've got some really cool pictures of oh nice of the yeah so and <laughs> of of the actual thing happening in right. vitro so, it, so yeah like because I think in the previous one right they just sh saw that it was it looked it would it would bind to the similar region that other inhibitors of the ribosome would bind to but that's not yeah. actually seeing it bind to the ribosome in that region so yeah this is actually a, fa a fantastic sequel to that previous paper because this one you can actually see that happening Absolutely. which i appreciate a lot yeah um, but also so, so yeah. fast like this paper yeah. this was published just now oh yeah just that just yeah just now <laughs> it was a little, yeah just Two two days ago, this yeah, was made so available. Yeah, so hot on the heels of like a large survey that narrows down something. Here's now a like a much more detailed mechanism paper on uh, yeah the NSP one. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, Just and... to show everyone's working on this right now, right? And like yeah, yeah. There's so much confirmation and cross comparison of data. Oh yeah, they got a lot of structures in here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Next paper, so it's flu season now and SARS-CoV-2 season, so what will happen? And Get your flu shot. So, <laughs> like... Yeah, get your flu shot. <laughs> Co-infection of influenza A virus enhances SARS-CoV-2 infectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, so... from a lot of fields, because flu is such a ubiquitous, you're right, it's a, it's a seasonal yeah. virus that's, you know, plagued humans for a long time. And uh, right, there are huge global networks We have flu surveillance, because it's a big problem. Yeah. Um, and uh, sure enough, uh, and, and research has emerged in other diseases that because flu, act, you know, it's infecting our cells, it's changing them a little bit, turning us on alert in a different way. It mm -hmm. interacts really different. It sometimes interacts synergistically with other infections, right? Because yeah. it's like, oh, your body's responding to flu, but that particular response isn't good for another response that you're doing, right? And then that means you get this other infection worse than you would previously. Um, so yeah, I I mean just recalling the 1918 flu outbreak, a lot of people working in streptococcus and staphylococcus, lots lots of people were dying of those secondary diseases rather yeah. than influenza. Yeah. Oh, so, it's huge in staph. Yeah. Yeah. Like a huge area of like co-infection. Oh. Literature. Strep is yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, strep is what we had like in in our lab. I think because our lab is like based on Queen's Charlotte, was like a hundred years old. So they had some samples from the 1920s oh, wow. of those like old <laughs> ancient inf old ancient like strep strains that were connected to that so yeah. it's been something that's really a fascinating story because because it's one of those things like where people go, oh the influenza outbreak in 1918 that that terrible kill and this is where i go well actually <laughs> <laughs> technically they didn't die from the flu <laughs> technically it was a whole other disease i can talk about would you like to talk about my phd and and they can't escape then and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ask the question, they're getting the answer. <laughs> yeah, they're getting the answer. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so in this one, they're talking about how influenza might prime us for a more severe COVID infection. It's actually through upregulation of ACE2, <laughs> um, yeah. is what they're saying in this paper, uh, this preprint. So kind of interesting. Uh, you know, it's those things. They, it's, it's all chance. I mean, infection, well, actually, that's not true. But like, a lot about infection can sometimes go to come down to coincidence, right? Like coincidentally uses this, right? It's not like I don't yeah. believe influenza could be thought of co-evolving to be this like evil thing that works together with um, with SARS-CoV-2. But it's like they all infect cells. They infect they're both respiratory yeah. infections, right? So like there's a limited number of pool of proteins, right, to work on. They're all interconnected anyways. Sometimes you end up having just a really bad uh, combo and uh, yeah, this is this is where we're at. <clears throat> like you know, influenza for a lot of diseases, influenza is a big bullying playground that beats up someone and and other diseases like 
Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whereas, like, SARS-CoV-2 is another, and then they both gang up. They're like, okay, well, things things are gonna are gonna go badly. Mm-hmm. So it's. A lot of things that, because a lot of things that help one virus will help another. Because like they both attack the immune system, and they both, and so right. you get. I mean, there may be some situations where they interfere with each other. Like if they share some genetic code or something like that, then you can get viruses that mess with each other. But or if they like both, if maybe like one of them induces, like in the attempt to uh, have the immune response shift away from it, right? It induces like a different type of immune response, but yeah. that immune response is better for like fighting off other infections, then you wouldn't have this sort of issue. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some, I know it's completely escaping me, unfortunately, so I'm not gonna go down that path, but. Um... <laughs> but yeah, so we got some cell culture infection here, um, yep. biochemistry stuff. Do they ever go into animals maybe? Don't know, does yeah, it seem I don't like? Know. Uh... I don't see animals so far as I'm scrolling through. Calu three yeah. cells, A five four nine cells, MD CK cells. Yeah, I don't think they end up doing animals. So this is all this is all ba- this is all based on observations that they're seeing in um, in cell culture. Right. Okay. Uh, so next one in PNAS, we've got broad host range of SARS-CoV two predicted by comparative and structural analysis of ACE two invertebrates. Yeah, this was a weird one. I just picked this one because um, it gets kind of old. It's not even that new of a paper. Um, but I thought that it was interesting, like the way in which, you know, sorry, it's it's jumped, right, between uh, obviously bats and humans and pangolins yeah. potentially, right, if people talk about yet undescribed intermediate host. Um, yeah, these, there's definitely, oh, I gotta want to open this They up. look at a lot of different animals here i mean so they look at a lot of mammals they they mentioned that it's it, it's so the golden hamsters and the other hamsters that we looked at they're all the syrian hamsters are vulnerable to it so it's well they so and that, that makes them fairly okay models <laughs> and um, this is yeah this is stuff that i believe there was a paper that came out earlier that talked about like all the different animals that are good as models but yeah. i think this the perspective they took here was like a huge data set of like um all sorts of vertebrates and so like we're seeing a, a bigger overview right of the potential um the potential i guess hosts that the, these viruses could infect <clears throat> yeah i mean they look at like hamsters they look at i mean another thing that is like cats and and tigers and domestic animals are another aspect because there have been stories of them the getting Bronx infected. zoo well had the tiger that yeah. got infected there have been i guess these anecdotal <laughs> stories about cats um yeah i mean this is not like super i think it's a kind of interesting sort of paper we we don't often talk about this i don't know if yeah. it's the right choice for us but um i did want to sort I mean, of show some of the other research i guess that's going on this might yeah. actually end up dovetailing with uh stories about like the viral evolution right it could yeah it, it might be more about like i think where this might contribute to like sort of the global effort against uh sars cov 2 and pandemics is more in that realm maybe it's helping to describe some uh approaches we you could take to surveillance Right, like yeah. this could help identify potential emerging. Uh, like once you know a receptor, you can do this sort of analysis and say, do people live in places that they come into contact a lot with these animals? Those are places that are fruitful for surveillance. I could see it driving some of that information. And I also see it going the other other way when like looking at species that are threatened by us because we now carry coronavirus. So sure. I mean, they talk about like things <laughs> like. Uh, whales, some whales are susceptible to it, and the, so, to some of those are on like the endangered species list. So if we go into like the, their areas and cough on them, suddenly no more. Oh whales. no, that's so sad. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. imagine like if we if the vaquito is like this tiny little dolphin where there are only twenty left in the whole world. Yeah. If they're that... vulnerable to the coronavirus, I mean, yeah, we. I mean, that's a that's a. That is a that's a sucky vision sometimes of like humans, right? Like we, we we modify our ecosystems, right? That's part of our evolutionary strategy, right? Is like modifying it for our own purposes, and like as a result, right? Like we have brought into contact animals that don't normally come into contact through our practices. We might be enabling like the production of new strains of infective 
uh, agents and then maybe also disseminating them to some of these animals. Oh, that'd be too bad. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know there are some species where like people thought like were thought, oh, this this virus came from the species, but no, it turned out we gave it to them. Like I think, <laughs> like yeah. badgers and tuberculosis, perhaps. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, don't quote me on that. I could be completely wrong on that, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure of the. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. But yeah, a much more sort of broad science paper. Uh, um, I don't think necessarily relevant to this, but interesting. I mean, very interesting that you people would even go down this path. Like, uh, yeah. I heard about this paper because, like, it's he's like a totally unrelated scientist. I would never guess like that this scientist, evolutionary biologist, would end up doing stuff on SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> I mean, it'll get, it's good for impact, good for his career. I mean, I, if you can do SARS-CoV-2 research, now is the time to do it. Everybody. If you do it in five years' time, it's not going to be get, get you as much notoriety. So <laughs> drop everything you're doing and do SARS. That's <laughs> what we're doing. I mean, yeah. I don't want. I'm not going to judge. I mean, it's true. <laughs> yes, the bandwagon's big enough for all of us. <laughs> yeah, it's a, and it's not like is the bandwagon is not going in an important direction. It's not like a, mm-hmm. a random trend. This is something that's affecting us all. I mean, true. Go, I'm about to go into lockdown for another three months. Well, between three months and infinity, depending on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see what else. Oh, yeah. we got two models coming up. Uh, yes. Oh, we had so, briefly talked about something like this. Three-dimensional alveolar stem cell culture models reveal infection response to SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, we've looked at cell culture models, and mm-hmm. let's look. And But now we can look at them in 3D. We can... 1970s technology today. Um, I'm, <laughs> without I'm, the glasses. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, without the glasses, yeah. <laughs> But no, this is like, so usually we, when we look at cell cultures, they tend to be on a flat surface, but 3D tries to replicate the kind of structure of these cells as they would be inside the human body. So thus, mm-hmm. we can learn a bit more about them. Yeah, and uh, people yeah. call these organoids is another way people talk about this stuff because it's just like, yeah. you know, tissue to organ. It's like a more complicated, the 3D adds like a new level of complexity, right? Because all the cells aren't the same or even statistically the same. Yeah. Like there's like different regions that like govern different stuff. So you see interactions in a more realistic uh, scenario. Yeah, I mean, they, this is interesting. This has evolved quite a bit because I remember like, ages ago people would put them into alginate beads and then they'd mm-hmm. put, put, throw them together and mm-hmm. then and then they'd form a form a structure but thing is it wouldn't necessarily re- relate to humans so actually trying to figure out because they've taken actual stem cell cultures and put them into uh, a medium to develop these organoids so yeah i mean yeah yeah and, no it's it's gone it's gone very far i know that they use and this particular one right they're they're screening them for. Oh no, they're not. This is not screening. That's the next one. This one is yeah, just like one. the the establishment of a model. <clears throat> this is yeah. very close to what I was doing in my graduate research. Uh, oh really? Because yeah, because I was making epithelial skin models, right? Oh, so wow. they had like uh, they differentiated. It was they weren't spheres. They were just layers, but they had hmm. like all the layers that you'd associate with the the epidermis. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, and it's really different, right? Because cell, like, really, w- cellular identity is uh, very different, right, across your body. Mm-hmm. And and having more different types of cells together, like, there are things that happen in those systems that you're not capturing when you just do cell culture. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and three dimensional. So we're going to go and move on to the next paper, which is uh, identification of SARS-CoV-2 inhibitors using. Lung, lung and colonic organoids. Mm-hmm. So, so here we're seeing is... like an application of this sort of technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and this is what I this is what I was going down the path of saying is that this actually has become very common because it's like they've done back in the day of high throughput screening. People did high throughput screening on cell cultures, right? You'd have like mm. big plates full of like little wells full of cells, and you try all the drugs on them. But like mm. with this, uh, with the I guess the advancements in technology and organoids, now you can have organoids in those plates, right? And you can yeah. have like little like balls of cells that have like different structures. And screening drugs through those is like even more realistic than screening drugs through cell culture. Um, yeah, yeah. 
And, like, one of the advantages of them is that, I mean, they, they aren't necessarily as good as animal models, but they can still tell you a lot more than cell cultures and can almost replace animal models for some functions, which is yeah. a really good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, definitely. And also, you still want to move it out into animal models, but you could never fit, like, 364 <laughs> mice in a tray and you give them drugs, right? Like, uh, yeah. the high throughput nature is is a big, a big plus in these. Yeah, uh, it allows you to do much more. Mm -hmm. it, and... I, I can so understand the argument that it's, it's still not as like like replicating a whole human in this in this page tradition yeah. yet, but yeah. you can still find some very important information. Actually, understanding what what how that reflects human situation can be very interesting. Absolutely. And <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, again, there's something there are models that we haven't investigated into too much depth. And also, given your experience in this, I'm I'm quite interested in. Oh. Hearing what you're... <laughs> I mean, I didn't work on these particular organoids, right? Like these ones, they're using lung. Um, mm. So, like, really, all I have to speak about is <laughs> like the the usefulness of these models, right? Like, right. Uh, like how they differ basically from cell culture. And I I think that that actually would be better explained in the in the alveolar, the right? Yeah, in yeah. the characterization of the model. But this one, I mean, if people are interested in seeing the way that that and they're used to find drugs. Um, and like, the, you know what I always find fascinating about this is you actually get histology <laughs> when you do <laughs> the staining on these, right? Like, yeah, uh, it's cell culture, but you actually see like, uh, like this, like regions, um, regions of interest. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so I think that brings us to, we've listed all the, the papers that we kind of brought to, this and I've got a lot of stuff <laughs> got a lot but, of stuff but a lot of it too we were just we just wanted to sort of highlight for people like film your conspiracy yeah. theory lockdown related trans ethnic analysis yeah this first molecular architecture of early dissemination that's one that we could do right yeah. um that's sort of like uh big evolutionary biology it's coming evolution of the virus learning about this variant d614 yeah. Uh, if we want to really dig into D614, what's the best paper for that? The spike mutation alters fitness? Is that the best one? Uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I wouldn't say the old, I think the one that like describes a bit more into like the uh, binding of it, I thought that that was kind of a, a bit more interesting in that regard because uh, mm -hmm. I think that moved into animal models. Um, no, wait, I'm looking at a different paper, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Let me download this spike mutation alters. I don't have it. It's not in the Zotero. I'm attaching it now. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah. For, for people watching, we well, have we a Zotero linked in the... That you can read all these papers on if you'd like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you if something caught your interest or... Um, yeah, you want to dig in. Oh, yeah, you dig in with us. Ask questions about them. <laughs> We're happy to be here. Yeah, the... The spike mutation D614G alters SARS-CoV-2 fitness. They do cell culture at first, and then they do the neutralization assay. It's actually a pretty short paper. There's not a lot here. Okay. Not this one. Not this one. <clears throat> and, yeah. uh, you think one of them went into animal models? Uh, no, I think I missed some. So I looked. I was looking at the the MAS the complement paper, which I which also was one I was quite interested in. Yeah, that could be one. That's like another piece of the immunology puzzle that we haven't been speaking about. There are four figures in this one. They Yeah, they do go into animals here, though. This is where they're using ferrets. They start with biochemistry, and then they look at uh, hamsters or ferrets. That's SARS-CoV-2 spike uh, D614G variant confers enhanced replication enhanced of replication and transmissibility. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So, yeah, that would be the one of the papers I'd be interested in because they do the transmissibility experiment. Yeah, and, and we can get the, like, looking at found effects. We haven't, right, we talked about the, the, the creation of that transmissibility model, but here's a use for it, right? Like, here's yeah. something that they observed in nature. We observed the, the increase of this particular variant, and now we're asking in a model, right, does it, do, does it make a difference? Um, yeah, they don't go down to mechanism, but, yeah, there's that. Uh, the neuropillin double feature <clears throat> we could talk about, mm. right? Yeah, we could. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Then, yeah, MASP. MASP. Uh, I, I, I quite like the, the MASP one, but... Non-structural um, protein? How are you feeling about that one? Ooh, non-structural protein. Um, 
I guess we already I mean, talked about it last week, kind of. Yeah. 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 It's basically, I mean, it's one I'm going to read because I want to see the fun images, but it's probably not one I need to talk about. But Right. right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't want, not evolution, and then maybe one of the model ones. Okay, we got, we got a few different things. Well, last time we did, uh, we did do a molecular pathogenesis one. Yeah. Um, but we didn't talk about the immune system. I, you know, I could go for the MASP one. Um, I actually, I want to talk about D614G. That's yeah. sort of where I am. But I'm okay also just doing it with the massive second wave version where they identify it. Um, but I guess animal models is what we do. <laughs> or animal, we're more yeah. poised to speak about animal models usually than, than other papers. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, because, yeah, I... I, I agree. So, because uh, again, the animal model paper seems like it's going to be. I'm, I'm going to have a lot more to say of that about that than the uh, mm -hmm. paper that's about the kind of measuring the outbreak. Um, yeah, it's a short. It's a short paper, which is good, which is nice. Mm -hmm. That gives us time to linger, and maybe it gives us time also to speak more about the background of D614G. Yeah. Right. We can like maybe like uh, flush out a bit more of the background and then dive into the four figures. Um, yeah, I mean, we could try to pull in some of the information from the Musa paper to... Yeah, 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 to just, like, tell the story of, like, here's how they found it out in the... Or here's one story about where it was found in the wild, and then here are the, the, the work that's been done in the research to, <laughs> to actually give us relevance, right? Like, it's one thing to find that association. It's another thing to then tell us, like, oh, this has a real biological effect. <clears throat> Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. Like kind of lingering more on the introduction of D614G, but ultimately going through the papers of uh, enhanced replication and transmissibility. Yeah, I, I like that as well. I think that that's what we'll get, because we haven't talked about D6 one. We've, we've talked about it in passing, but we haven't really focused down on it. Yeah, we haven't and, focused down on it. And like people are talking about like, how does it relate to vaccines? Like maybe we can answer some of those questions <laughs> along yeah. the way. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I think we have that. So if you, you want to join along, then you can tweet us about this paper, about what your thoughts on it are. Well, yeah, tweet us your questions about D614G or leave us uh, something in the comments. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, hopefully we'll catch, we'll catch up with you next week and we can uh, talk about uh, this interesting paper, well, these interesting papers and this interesting kind of story that we've becoming about this. Mm -hmm. This weirdly, Absolutely. yeah, it's because it's more infectious, but it's still vulnerable to vaccines. Does it change your meat? What does it do? We'll, yep. we'll find out next week. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, I'll see, see you next week. Bye.